After a challenging day at work, I returned home to find my wife Jane absent. Jane, I called out, my voice echoing through the quiet house. Our playful nickname exchange from the time we met at a costume party flashed through my mind. She, dressed as Tarzan and I as Jane, had sparked an instant connection amidst the crowd. Fast forward to now, and I was sitting on the couch, cracking open a beer as I tuned into the evening news. Suddenly Jane appeared, and my breath caught. She was stunningly dressed in my favorite black dress, the hem of which skimmed her hips and the cleavage was tantalizingly alluring. The sight of her, and the jubilee necklace adorning her neck, stunned me for a moment. On a reflexive impulse, I reached for my phone to capture the moment, unaware of what lay ahead of me. Didn't realize we had plans, I managed to say, attempting to regain my composure. But Jane's response shattered any illusion of a quiet evening together. She explained about Logan Wood's dinner invitation, oblivious to my growing unease. Logan Wood, infamous within our social circle for his inappropriate advances, was the last person I wanted my wife spending an evening with. My objections fell on deaf ears as Jane asserted her independence, citing our wedding vows as a token of mutual trust. But to me, those vows were more than mere words. They were a sacred promise of fidelity and respect. As she made her way to the door, I couldn't help but feel a surge of possessiveness and concern. I may not own you, I interjected, desperation seeping into my voice, but when we exchanged vows, we committed to each other. Yet, even as I spoke, I couldn't shake the sinking feeling that our bond was slipping away, one careless decision at a time. Come on, don't be so archaic. This is the 21st century, and no one believes it anymore, Jane replied. I replied, I wish you had said that sooner. We could have gotten a divorce and lived freely, dating whoever we wanted. Her response, laughter. As she made her way to the door, I grabbed an old friend from the coat closet at Louisville Slugger. There's Logan pulling in, she said casually. Order yourself some pizza or something. Jane, I called out as she turned around, seizing the opportunity to tear the dress off her, leaving her in nothing but skimpy black lingerie and heels. She bolted back inside, and I strolled towards Logan's car, bat in hand. He wasted no time in reversing out of there, leaving skid marks in his wake. Returning to the house, I nonchalantly stowed the bat away and fetched a fresh beer. Jane soon descended, wrapped in her robe, her fury palpable. As she unleashed a torrent of anger and frustration, I remained silent, letting her tirade run its course. What were you thinking? Or were you even thinking? I finally interjected, once her rant had subsided. Her response was a lament about our mundane routine, a longing for the fun we once shared. And how come I'm not me hearing about this now? I countered. And those times I suggested something different. You were always too busy or uninterested. Her attempt to justify her actions left me incredulous. Cheating is cheating, regardless of how you spin it, I asserted firmly. Her hopeful gaze, seeking permission, only confirmed my worst fears. You've truly lost your mind, I muttered, disbelief mingling with disappointment. I need to get out of here before I do, or say something we'll both regret. I muttered to myself, snatching my keys and darting out the door before she could react. Like any self-respecting man, I headed straight to my favorite bar to drown my sorrows in beer. What's eating you, Dylan? Sam asked, sliding another bottle in front of me. You look like you've lost your best friend. I might as well have, I sighed heavily. Jane came home tonight, dressed to the nines, telling me she's going out with some creep from work and that I shouldn't bother waiting up. Did you put your foot down? Sam inquired. Of course I did. What does he take me for? I grumbled, ready to wipe the smirk off his face. Just messing with you, man. Sam chuckled, sensing my frustration. I recounted the evening's events, from Jane's defiance to the dramatic moment I tore her dress off, leaving her exposed to the prying eyes of the neighbors. Then I marched towards the car with my Louisville slugger, and the creek bolted. Sounds like a win for you, Sam remarked, offering me another beer. The victory was short-lived, I confessed. She came downstairs, 
guns blazing, ranting about our lackluster sex life and how it wouldn't be cheating if she had my permission. Sam was speechless, and I knew it was time to leave. After a few more drinks and well wishes, I headed home, hoping for a better tomorrow. Jane was already in bed when I completed my evening routine. Slipping into my pyjama bottoms and settling under the covers, my back turned to her as sleep claimed me. Though I sensed her quiet sobs, I chose to ignore them. The next morning, Jane was already bustling about the kitchen preparing breakfast. The meal passed in relative silence until we finished cleaning up, and Jane broached the topic once more. Dylan, why can't you accept that times have changed? Nobody expects lifelong monogamy anymore, she asserted. I do, I counted firmly, and I didn't believe I'm alone in that sentiment. As for our past experiences with other partners, that's not what matters. When I asked you to marry me, it was because I knew you were the one I wanted to spend my life with. She seemed unconvinced. But what if I changed my mind? She questioned, her tone laden with uncertainty. Then maybe we should discuss divorce, I suggested reluctantly, bracing myself for her response. I didn't want a divorce, she admitted quietly, her gaze fixed on the floor. Then it's settled, I declared, though doubt lingered in the back of my mind. Despite Jane's assurances that she had relinquished thoughts of straying, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease. As days passed, any delay in her return home or lack of communication only fueled my suspicions. I found myself scrutinizing her actions, wondering if she harbored secret desires for another man. Without resorting to hiring a private investigator or resorting to invasive measures, I began dropping by her workplace unexpectedly and calling her at odd hours, hoping to assuage my growing apprehension. The tension between us was palpable, seeping into every aspect of our relationship, even our intimate moments. Our lovemaking lacked the spontaneity and fervor it once held, replaced by a sense of hesitation and detachment. Finally, unable to ignore the elephant in the room any longer, I gathered the courage to broach the subject. Jane, I think we need to get a divorce. I blurted out, bracing myself for her reaction. Her shock was evident, but I couldn't back down now. But that I thought we were okay, she stammered, disbelief clouding her features. Okay, do you honestly believe that? I countered, frustration creeping into my tone. We're nowhere near where we used to be, or where we should be. Dylan, is there anything I can do to change your mind? She implored, desperation etched in her eyes. I paused, considering my next words carefully. I'll agree to put the divorce on hold, but on one condition, I declared, watching her demeanor shift with intrigue. Anything, Dylan. I'll do anything, she responded eagerly, a glimmer of hope dancing in her eyes. Be careful what you agree to, I cautioned, a wry smile tugging at my lips. My condition is simple. You can date other men, but I reserve the same right with other women. Her initial surprise melted into amusement, concealed behind a saccharine smile. Of course, Dylan, anything. But I knew better than to underestimate the implications of her agreement, hidden beneath that veneer of sweetness. Dylan, that's only fair, she conceded, though I could sense her unease. I'll bet she didn't think I could get another woman. There's one more thing, I added, watching her reaction closely. What's that? She inquired, a hint of apprehension in her voice. You can't go out until I get a date, I stated firmly, gorging her response. Her agitation was evident, and I knew she had her plans already in place. She must have been worried about what would happen if I couldn't find anyone. To ease her concerns, I decided to offer a compromise. If I can't find a date in two weeks, you can go on a date, I proposed. Her face lit up with one of the brightest smiles I'd seen from her in weeks, and she enveloped me in a flurry of kisses. That's wonderful, Dylan. Thank you, she exclaimed, her enthusiasm palpable. You'll see, this will be just the thing to reinvigorate our marriage. Yeah, reinvigorate it right into the toilet. I muttered under my breath. A few days later, I could tell she was taken aback when I informed her I had a date and suggested a double date for the following Friday. I suspected she agreed, thinking I was bluffing and that she'd have her evening while I stayed her alone. Little did Jane know, 
I had arranged a date that I hoped would put an end to this foolishness once and for all. Sneaking out for a long lunch on Monday, I treated myself to some new clothes and left them in the car. On Friday, I left work early to get my hair styled, ensuring I'd be home before Jane. Quietly slipping into the guest room, I changed into my new outfit. With a quick shave and brushed teeth, I emerged from the shower to finish getting ready. I could see the surprise on her face when I stepped out, sporting my new look, but she recovered quickly. Logan will be picking me up at 6.45, she informed me. That's fine. Our reservation at Dory's restaurant is for 7.15. It's in my name in case you get there before us, I replied, heading out the door. What Jane didn't know was that we had a new employee at work, a guy named Isabella. She was a red-headed bombshell, the type that made every red-blooded American male's head swivel when she walked by. Despite her striking appearance, she maintained complete professionalism, never giving the office gossips anything to whisper about. We had developed a casual friendship, and while she occasionally flirted with me, I always politely shut her down by showing her my wedding ring. So when I asked her to meet me for drinks after work, she must have been curious. Arriving at the bar before her, I found myself staring glumly into my drink. So Dylan, what happened to break the last American Boy Scout out of his shell? She quicked with a laugh. But one look at my somber expression wiped the smile off her face. Oh Dylan, I'm so sorry, she murmured, placing a warm hand on mine. I didn't mean to tease you, but you're usually so composed. You look like you've lost your best friend. Tears welled up in my eyes and I turned away, feeling a rush of emotions. She wrapped her arm around my shoulder and led me to a table, patiently waiting as I collected myself. Finally, I mustered the courage to share my woes with her. To my surprise, she didn't offer pity or empty platitudes. Instead, she simply said, Well, there's only one thing we can do. We? I'll be your date. I couldn't help but laugh, the first genuine laughs since Jane's crazy idea had turned our lives upside down. Why me? I asked incredulously. Because you're not like the others, she replied earnestly. You treat me with respect, listen to my ideas, and stand up for me when others don't. And more importantly, I like you. I'm pissed at your wife for treating you with such disrespect. Her sincerity caught me off guard. So, do we have a date or not? She asked, her gaze unwavering. I nodded, a sense of relief washing over me. You're on. We finished our drinks, and I walked her to her car. She gave me her number and a friendly hug before driving off, leaving me feeling lighter than I had in weeks. My anticipation peaked when I pulled up in front of Isabella's apartment building. I barely had time to get out and open her door before she walked up to the car. Isabella was slightly taller than Jane, but still shorter than me. Isabella's dress was slightly longer than Jane's, reaching just above the knee, but still fitting her figure tightly. With a daring slit down the left side, almost to her hip, it was a bright emerald green color that accentuated the wavy bright red hair that cascaded down to halfway down her back. The neckline went lower, revealing more cleavage than I'd ever seen on Jane. As I helped her into the car, I almost averted my eyes from the impending closet malfunction. Slipping into the driver's seat, I was greeted by an expanse of creamy white thigh before Isabella adjusted her dress with a mischievous grin. There will be time for that later, cowboy, she teased, sending a rush of heat to my cheeks. I discreetly adjusted myself, feeling utterly embarrassed at her throaty laugh, as if I weren't already feeling self-conscious enough. To make matters worse, she began casually rubbing my thigh, causing my pulse to quicken and my face to flush. Thankfully, we arrived at the restaurant before things escalated further, and I managed to regain control of my composure. Upon entering the restaurant, I spotted Jane and Logan already seated. While Logan's appearance left me unimpressed, as it had on previous occasions, Jane had truly gone all out. I couldn't recall ever seeing her look that stunning, Logan remained seated, so I didn't bother offering him my hand, merely nodding to Jane as I helped Isabella into her seat. Jane appeared genuinely astonished that I had secured such a beautiful date. 
Any potential snarky remarks she might have made were wisely held back. On the contrary, Logan couldn't seem to divert his gaze from Isabella's cleavage. Jane had to elbow him in the ribs to ensure his eyes stayed in check. I anticipated dinner might be awkward, but after a hesitant start, a casual observer would have mistaken us for two ordinary couples rather than a husband and wife with different partners. Following dinner, we'd ventured to a club for drinks and dancing. Fast dances proceeded without particular issues, but during a slow dance, Isabella molded herself to me. In contrast, Jane's looks could have been lethal. She started rubbing up against Logan, as if attempting to engage in intimate activities right on the dance floor. Despite attracting attention that, under normal circumstances, would have embarrassed her, she seemed entirely lost in her own world. When Logan's hand ventured inside her dress to fondle her, I couldn't help but feel embarrassed for her. I promptly led Isabella back to the table. We continued, observing Jane and Logan making a spectacle of themselves until a manager approached, tapping them on the shoulder. Although I couldn't hear the conversation, it was apparent they were being asked to leave. Jane rushed back to the table in tears, grabbed her wrap, and swiftly departed the club with Logan closely behind. Well, you certainly know how to show a girl a good time, Isabel said, giggling. I could only join in the laughter, and we returned to the dance floor when we were ready to leave. I approached the manager and offered an apology for the behavior of our companions. Oh, no problem, sir. We don't blame you, he replied. Well, I do feel a little responsible. You see, that was my wife, or shall I say soon-to-be ex-wife, and I think she was a little jealous of my date here. The manager seemed taken aback, then glanced at Isabella with a smile. I see, sir, he said. Please come back any time. With that, he returned to his duties. I escorted Isabella back to her apartment and walked her to her door. As I leaned in for a friendly goodnight kiss, she surprised me by pulling me into a passionate embrace. Would you like to come in for a nightcap? She asked, her intentions clear. Who was I to argue? The notion of a nightcap was quickly forgotten as soon as the door closed behind us. Isabella pushed me down onto the couch, straddling my lap, and we shared a night of passion. I woke up at Isabella's place to a gentle kiss. After showering separately, I decided to make her breakfast. Wow, she exclaimed. A great lover, and he cooks. I may just keep you around. I chuckled. About that, I like you a lot, and last night was absolutely amazing, but I need to resolve the issues in my marriage. Even if we divorce, I don't know how soon I'll be ready for another relationship. Don't worry, Delan, she reassured me. I was just teasing you. I like you too, and if things work out, I could certainly see us in a relationship. But you're right, first you have to settle things with your wife. We finished eating, making idle conversation until I decided it was time to go home and see if there was anything left of our marriage to salvage. I stepped into the kitchen to find Jane sitting at the table, her eyes red from crying, clutching a coffee cup. The sight of my satisfied expression triggered a fresh wave of tears from her. I poured myself a cup of coffee and took a seat opposite her. So how was your night with Logan? I asked. Oh, Dylan, it was horrible, she confessed between sobs. All I could think about was you with Isabella. She's so sexy and beautiful. I know I could never compete. You do realize you wouldn't have had to worry about competing with her if you hadn't started this foolishness. I pointed out gently. Jane couldn't meet my eyes but nodded in agreement. I think I can safely say that you wouldn't be feeling so regretful if it had only been you and Logan, and I was left sitting at home alone. I continued. Jane's tear-filled eyes met mine briefly before she dropped them again, nodding once more. I just don't know what to do, she admitted her voice breaking. One part of me wants to just kick you to the curb and start over with someone new, she confessed, openly sobbing now. But then I look at you and see the woman I married, the woman I fell in love with. I don't see an evil but a foolish girl, and I think, I hope, that there's a way back for us. Hope began to shine in her eyes through her tears. I'm going to change my clothes and go out for a while, I said, rising from my seat. While I'm out, I think you should move your things into the guest room. When I get back, we'll talk some more. 
Please don't make me move, Derlan, she pleaded, desperation evident in her voice. How can we get back together if we're apart? I need you now more than ever. You're not getting the point, I replied firmly. It's not a given that we are getting back together. Maybe you should have thought about how much you needed me before you started this, I said, before heading up to our bedroom. Jane was still seated at the table when I descended the stairs, making my way towards the door. Delan, she called out, and I paused, turning to face her. I love you, she said softly. I simply nodded and left the house. It may seem cold, but I needed her to understand the fragility of our marriage. I walked down to the river and strolled along the shore, watching rowers and sailboats moving gracefully through the water. Eventually, I sat down on a bench surrounded by families with small children. The sight saddened me, and I wondered if Jane and I would ever have children, as we had discussed. I lost track of time and felt a chill as the sun dipped below the horizon. Sighing heavily, I headed back home. Upon returning, I found Jane still seated where I had left her, her hopeful gaze meeting mine as I entered. I shook my head sadly and retreated to my room, locking the door behind me. Collapsing onto the bed fully clothed, I covered my eyes with my arm. I'm not sure how long I lay there before I heard a soft knock on the door and a whispered Dylan. I remained silent, and after a moment, I heard her footsteps retreat to the guest room. Once I was certain she had retired for the night, I took a quick shower and fell into a fitful sleep. The next morning, I descended to find Jane had prepared a hearty breakfast. Surprisingly, I had a good appetite, though Jane only picked at her food. Dylan, she began tentatively, do you think we could try counselling? The idea lingered in my mind. I wasn't familiar with counselling, but they tried to sway me towards Jane's desires. Did I even want to salvage our relationship? One thing I realised from my time with Isabella was that our sex life had become stagnant and predictable. Did I truly want to return to that? I was still resentful that Jane had never voiced any concerns to me. Despite my anger, I knew that there was still enough love for Jane in my heart to warrant a fight. Okay, Jane, let's give counselling a shot, I said, observing her nearly jump from her chair with excitement. But let's be clear, I continued firmly, I don't want a counsellor who's solely focused on saving our marriage. Maybe it can be salvaged, maybe it can't. I won't tolerate any hidden agendas. I could sense her disappointment, perhaps she had hoped for a counsellor who aligned with her times of change philosophy. However, she had no choice but to agree. Surprisingly, counselling proved remarkably effective. Jane began to understand how her refusal to cooperate contributed to our dissatisfaction, and I learned the importance of assertiveness. Through counselling, we delved into our desires, needs and expectations for our sex life. Yet, despite progress, I couldn't shake the betrayal I felt. Though I prevented Jane from completing her betrayal, she struggled with insecurities regarding Isabella. No matter how much I explained my feelings, she couldn't grasp that our date was merely a symbolic gesture. Ultimately, we mutually decided on an amicable divorce. Once the divorce was finalized, I took a moment to assess my life. No, I didn't immediately jump into a relationship with Isabella. Instead, I booked a room in a B&B along the coast during the pre-season, where the weather matched my unsettled mood perfectly. I needed time to decompress and contemplate my next steps. Upon my return, I reached out to Isabella, and we went out for dinner. I allowed her to take me to her bed, but it was more for comfort than passion. As we lay there, I couldn't help but think about how easy it would be to ask her to make our connection permanent. I'm very fond of you, I admitted, and I know I could easily fall in love with you. But I'm not sure if it would be fair to either of us. My divorce is still fresh, and I'm concerned this might be a rebound affair. I think it's best if we both see others as well as each other for a while. Isabella nodded solemnly. I wish I could argue with you, but I'm afraid you're right, she said. It's probably better to be safe than sorry. We got out of bed, showered separately, and had a quiet breakfast. Despite the temptation to throw caution to the wind, I held firm to my decision. After cleaning up, Isabella walked me to the door, and we hugged each other tearfully. 
I guess this is goodbye, she said softly. No, not goodbye, I replied, just so long for now. Why don't we meet for dinner, say, two weeks from Friday, just to check in? Okay, she agreed, giving me a kiss on the cheek before easing me out the door. The sound of the door closing echoed like a cell door, leaving me uncertain if I had just made the gravest mistake of my life. Nonetheless, I met with Isabella after two weeks, and we had a pleasant conversation. This time, I simply dropped her back at her place. Three days later, we went on another date. Six months later, she moved in with me, and it was another year before we were married. In the meantime, Jane, my ex-wife, quit her job and found work elsewhere. As for Logan, he was fired from his job after he was caught with a female colleague. He is now in the hospital due to an altercation with a woman's ex-husband, a Marine, who did not handle the situation well. It is unknown if Logan will have a home upon his release, as his wife has filed for divorce and seems intent on actively pursuing it. Five years later, I unexpectedly encountered Jane at a local diner. She appeared a mere shadow of her former self, frail and aged beyond her years. Not wanting any disruptions to the contentment Isabella and I had found, I subtly signaled to her and we promptly left the diner without placing an order. Though Jane undoubtedly saw me, I had no inclination to engage with her. Life was proceeding just fine without the complications. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts on this story in the comments below the video, and don't forget to like, share with friends and subscribe. Have a great vacation.